A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. The Japanese began the war from the air at Pearl Harbor. They have been repaid many fold, and the end is not yet. With this bomb, we have now added a new and revolutionary increase in destruction to supplement the growing power of our armed forces. In their present form, these bombs are now in production, and even more powerful forms are in development. It is an atomic bomb. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. The force from which the sun draws its power has been loosed against those who brought war to the Far East. We have spent more than $2 billion on the greatest scientific gamble in history, and we have won. But the greatest marvel is not the size of the enterprise, its secrecy, or its cost, but the achievement of scientific brains in making it work. The Anarcho-Christian Podcast, evaluating the relationship between the Christian and the state. Give us a king to rule us when you're gone. His life's work had been to help the people understand. It's not the role of a man to rule over other men. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the show. One of the most contested events in U.S. history is the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it isn't just something left to political theorists or historians to debate. It's something that is debated hotly in Christian circles. On one side, we have the appalling intentional targeting of hundreds of thousands of civilians. And on the other side, we have that defended on the grounds of its necessity and efficiency. And this side has a lot of reason to defend it because within these Christian arguments, there is some very important context to consider. First, it needs to be justified because it is an act of mass casualty and massive destruction from a Christian nation. And second, If the support for this event is at all shaky, it undermines the unconditional support of the U.S. military. And I can't put too fine a point on that. And it's something we all need to consider when arguing against the support of the atomic bombings in Japan. The righteousness of all military activity from the U.S. has been so built up within the hearts and minds of U.S. citizens that it must be defended at all costs. Because if we question the motives of the U.S. wars and conflicts, we risk questioning the legitimacy of the sacrifices from our relatives. I do sympathize with this greatly. I think it's important to recognize. In my experience, when you are talking to people who have lost loved ones in war, their immediate defense of all military actions isn't as much because of a highly invested fear of invasion or a philosophical belief. But it is a highly invested fear that the loss of their parent or child, brother or sister, fear of that loss being for nothing. We can talk quite a bit about philosophy and historical records, but what I think lurks deep down in these defenses for something like intentionally bombing hundreds of thousands of civilians, is the need to not have been duped. The need for that loss of life or limb to not have been for nothing. So with that said, I want to continue this conversation about the nuclear bombings of Japan in 1945. I want to address the Christian defenses for this event. And I hope you'll see that I'm doing it lovingly. This will definitely not be an exhaustive review of the history or defenses, but I think it will address the majority of the arguments that happen, and 
set you in a good direction in case you want to look further into it. I started out the episode with the announcement from President Truman of the Hiroshima bombing. But let's step back a little bit further to start our discussion. World War II started on September 1st, 1939, when Hitler's Germany invaded Poland. And it ended with Japan's surrender exactly six years later, on September 2nd, 1945. We definitely can't go into all of the nuances, but I want to zero in on some major points leading up to August of 1945. Vice President, Mr. Speaker, members of the Senate and of the House of Representatives, yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with that nation, and at the solicitation of Japan, was still in conversation with its government and its emperor, looking toward the maintenance of peace in the Pacific. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost. In addition, American ships have been reported torpedoed on the high seas between San Francisco and Honolulu. As Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, I have directed that all measures be taken for our defense. But always will our whole nation remember the character of the onslaught against us. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. I believe that I interpret the will of the Congress and of the people, when I assert that we will not only defend ourselves to the uttermost, but will make it very certain that this form of treachery shall never again endanger us. Hostilities exist. There is no blinking at the fact that our people, our territory, and our interests are in grave danger. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph so help us God. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. On December 7, 1941, 
Japanese aircraft attacked the naval base in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Up until that point, the U.S. had stayed out of the war, at least in any obvious military campaign sort of way. It is unfortunate that key distinguishing features of the U.S. involvement have been somewhat lost or disregarded. Nevertheless, most people don't know of the U.S. blockades and embargoes against Japan during the first half of the war. Some people say that the U.S. is remaining neutral during this time because there are no boots on the ground. But any armchair historian should be able to repeat the maxim that is generally attributed to Frederick Bastiat. When goods don't cross borders, soldiers will. As a side note, this exact phrase won't be found in Bastiat's writings, but there are passages that clearly explain the concept. Regardless of who coined the term, or if the U.S. was within its right or duty to blockade a member of the Axis countries, and this is not at all a justification for Japan to attack the U.S., we need to consider inevitable consequences to political and military actions as goods necessary for Japan's war effort did not cross into their borders, and their soldiers crossed out. And be that as it may, the attack on Pearl Harbor that killed nearly 2,500 U.S. servicemen was the start to the U.S. involvement in World War II, and remains today as the most effective rallying cry or backing to that involvement. And since that is the case, I think this is the time to point out a few things, because this is the first line of support of the bombings that will happen four years later. First, in 1940, a memo from the Office of Naval Intelligence, ONI, written by Lieutenant Commander Arthur McCollum, suggested a new American foreign policy that called for provoking Japan into an overt act of war against the United States. The memorandum advocated eight actions that predicted would lead to such an act. 1. Make an arrangement with Britain for the use of British bases in the Pacific, particularly Singapore. Two. Make an arrangement with the Netherlands for the use of base facilities and acquisition of supplies in the Dutch East Indies. 3. Give all possible aid to the Chinese government. 4. Send a division of long-range heavy cruisers to the Orient, Philippines, or Singapore. 5. Send two divisions of submarines to the Orient. 6. Keep the main strength of the U.S. fleet now in the Pacific, in the vicinity, of the Hawaiian Islands. 7. Insist that the Dutch refuse to grant Japanese demands or undue economic concessions, particularly oil. 8. Completely embargo all U.S. trade with Japan, in collaboration with a similar embargo imposed by the British Empire. And then it ends, if by these means Japan could be led to commit an overt act of war, so much the better. At all events, we must be fully prepared to accept the threat of war. Needless to say, these eight actions were put in place, and the next year, as Point Six lines out, the main strength of the U.S. fleet in the Hawaiian Islands was attacked. To add further insult to injury, there are also memos of intercepts of Japanese communication showing that the U.S. knew of the pending attack the month prior. Robert Stennett sums it up quickly in a paragraph from his book, Day of Deceit, The Truth About FDR and Pearl Harbor. These intercepts and the corresponding radio logs of Station H are powerful evidence of American foreknowledge of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Americans do not know the records exist. All were excluded from many investigations that took place from 1941 to 1946 in the Congressional Probe of 1995. The most potent evidence is two radio dispatches sent by Admiral Tamamato to the 1st Air Fleet on November 25th, while the 31 warships were anchored at Hitokapu Bay in the Kuril Islands, awaiting instructions to sail to Hawaii. In his messages, Yamamato provides the evidence that contradicts American and Japanese claims of radio silence an exclusion of the words Hawaii and Pearl Harbor from radio transmissions prior to December 7th, 
Both claims are at the heart of the Pearl Harbor surprise attack lore. Yamamoto broke radio silence and directed the Japanese 1st Air Fleet to depart Hitokapu Bay on November 26th, advance into Hawaiian waters through the North Pacific, and attack the United States fleet in Hawaii. He even provided the latitude and longitude for portions of Route 2. So these two things are very important to justification and defense for the bombings that would later happen against Japan. It is quickly referenced today as well as then. 1942 would lead to the U.S. involvement on multiple fronts in World War II, Europe, North Africa, and of course the Pacific. On June 1st, two months prior to the first nuclear bombing, President Truman issued a warning to Japan. There can be no peace in the world until the military power of Japan is destroyed. With the same completeness as was the power of the European dictators. To do that, we are now engaged in a process of deploying millions of our armed forces against Japan in a mass movement of troops and supplies and weapons over 14,000 miles, a military and naval feat unequaled in all history. Substantial portions of Japan's key industrial centers have been leveled to the ground in a series of record incendiary raids. What has already happened to Tokyo will happen to every Japanese city whose industries feed the Japanese war machine. If the Japanese insist on continuing resistance beyond the point of reason, their country will suffer the same destruction as Germany. Our blows will destroy their whole modern industrial plant and organization, which they have built up during the past century, and which they are now devoting to a hopeless cause. We have no desire or intention to destroy or enslave the Japanese people, but only surrender can prevent the kind of ruin which they have seen come to Germany as a result of continued useless resistance. One thing a lot of people don't realize is that the U.S. was firebombing Tokyo extensively prior to the August bombings, as Truman referenced in the warning. Beginning in 1942 with the infamous Doolittle Raid, Tokyo and other parts of Japan became targets for the United States Air Force. Strategic and urban bombing began in 1944. The firebombing began on March 9th when 300 B-29 bombers dropped nearly 500,000 cylinders of napalm and petroleum jelly on the most densely populated areas of Tokyo, killing about 100,000 civilians and wiping out about half of the city. Words really fail to describe how absolutely horrific these firebombings were. Civilians were targeted for incineration as Tokyo was turned into an inferno. You can find pictures of the charred corpses from around the city. One survivor, Kisako Matoki, was 10 years old when she fled to a bridge when her parents and her brother were burned to death. She said afterwards that she saw melted bodies piled up on top of each other as high as houses. And black pieces, bits of bodies everywhere on the ground, and burnt corpses in the water. I hope by this point, we are not only thinking on the questionable origins that justify the attacks on Japanese civilians, but are also starting to evaluate, as Christians, the methods that a Christian nation employed to take vengeance on another nation. And when we say another nation, let's not get lost in the national pride and representative symbols. We are talking about individuals that are melted incinerated, and vaporized through napalm and radiation, and the majority of these individuals are not combatants. American Christians like to throw around the term just war theory. I've referenced it before, and like I've said at those times, I will one day give just war theory its due review, but today I want to focus on just one of its tenets. Christian just war theory begins with St. Augustine and really becomes more of a thorough study from St. Thomas Aquinas. The three criteria that Aquinas lays out for just war are 
One, that war needs to be waged by a legitimate authority. Two, it must have a just cause. And three, it must have the right intentions. Wrapped up in acquaintances' positions and adopted by any proponent of just war theory is that civilians must never be targets in a war. And this is a point I really want to stress because just war theory is a primary support of the bombings in Japan. Just war advocates may justify accidental civilian deaths, but if someone is supporting the intentional targeting of civilians in Tokyo, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki, they are in direct conflict with their advocacy of just war theory. And don't get me wrong, this isn't advocating for just war theory. The point is that the targeting of civilians that is forbidden doesn't change based on the amounts of civilians or the methods used. Someone putting a gun to an innocent person's head in an occupied war-torn area is just as much a violation of just war theory's ban on targeting civilians as dropping bombs that are the equivalent of creating a temporary sun to erupt in the center of a town, destroying, engulfing, burning, and melting everything and everyone for miles. In Hiroshima, the flash was so bright and the heat was so intense, shadows of the vaporized victims were burned into the cement and sides of walls where they were sitting and standing. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. The Japanese began the war from the air at Pearl Harbor. They have been repaid many fold, and the end is not yet. With this bomb, we have now added a new and revolutionary increase in destruction to supplement the growing power of our armed forces. In their present form, these bombs are now in production, and even more powerful forms are in development. It is an atomic bomb. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. The force from which the sun draws its power has been loosed against those who brought war to the Far East. We have spent more than two billion dollars on the greatest scientific gamble in history, and we have won. But the greatest marvel is not the size of the enterprise, its secrecy, or its cost, but the achievement of scientific brains in making it work. It was approximately 100,000 deaths at each of these events, the firebombing in Tokyo, and again at each of the nuclear explosions. It's unfortunately very common to forget all of the individuals that make up 100,000, or 200,000, or 300,000 civilians that were intentionally targeted. And the excruciating methods are so unimaginable to most people because they haven't really thought on it. Some of it is due to lack of knowledge. Some of it is due to the fact that it happened from a single event. I'm not sure why, but for some reason, killing 100,000 people with a single bomb just gets blown off by most people. So, with another support for the bombings in Japan gone, we may need to address some of the sporadic rhetoric that's also used. I'm going to address a few of those here. One, the nuclear bombs were needed to stop the Japanese. Two, they were needed to end the war quickly, thus preventing even more deaths. And three, they were needed to prevent a land invasion. These three are the majority of the common arguments you'll hear. Besides some of the cognitive dissonance that can be addressed here, like killing innocent people to save lives, we can quickly end these arguments with just a little research for quotes from men that were there, privy to the inside information during that war, and involved in high levels of planning during the war. In most situations, quotes from high-ranking military or political participants are the ultimate authority, and I would say that this is usually the case for any of the patriotic supporters of the atomic bombings. So let's just read through these, and I think you'll see exactly how they apply 
and unquestionably end these three big rhetorical justifications. I'll be taking some of them from an article that was written by our friend Alan Mosley. He graciously let us republish on anarchochristian.com, so when you're done with this episode, be sure to swing by there to get a little more context on some of these quotes. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, who would go on to become president, was chief among the naysayers. He said, I was against it, the use of the atomic bomb. I was against it on two counts. First, the Japanese were ready to surrender, and it wasn't necessary to hit them with that awful thing. Second, I hated to see our country be the first to use such a weapon. Although he made this statement publicly in 1963, he made the same argument to then-Secretary of War Henry Stimson in 1945, as recounted in his memoirs. I voiced to him my grave misgivings, first on the basis of my belief that Japan was already defeated and that dropping the bomb was completely unnecessary, and secondly, because I thought that our country should avoid shocking world opinion by the use of a weapon whose employment was, I thought, no longer mandatory as a measure to save American lives. It was my belief that Japan was, at that very moment, seeking some way to surrender with a minimum loss of face. Another prominent figure who echoed Eisenhower's sentiments was Fleet Admiral William D. Leahy. He ranked as the senior most United States military officer on active duty during World War II and was among Truman's chief military advisors. In his 1950 book, I Was There, Leahy wrote, It is my opinion that the use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance in our war against Japan. The Japanese were already defeated and ready to surrender because of the effective sea blockade and the successful bombing with conventional weapons. General MacArthur is another prominent and heroic military figure in the United States. His thoughts are recorded by his consultant Norman Cousins. When I asked General MacArthur about the decision to drop the bomb, I was surprised to learn he had not even been consulted. What, I asked, would his advice have been? He replied that he saw no military justification for the dropping of the bomb. The war might have been ended weeks earlier, he said, if the United States had agreed, as it later did anyway, to the retention of the institution of the emperor. And Brigadier General Carter Clark was the military intelligence officer in charge of preparing intercepted Japanese cables for Truman and his advisors is quoted saying, We didn't need to do it, and we knew we didn't need to do it, and they knew that we knew we didn't need to do it. We used them as an experiment for two atomic bombs. So I think these are important quotes to hang on to for people that look back now as if they have all the military strategy figured out and justify these bombings by saying, that they were necessary to end the war and prevent ground invasions. The consensus from the men that were there and have a lot more experience is that the bombs were not necessary. Getting back to the cognitive dissonance, another common justification is pointing out that the Japanese were cruel to the Chinese. This is very true. The stories of the Japanese soldiers in China are horrific. The brutal and grotesque murders of civilians in China are well documented and need no justification nor excuse. The problem, though, with this statement is that it's being used to brutally murder Japanese civilians because of what a Japanese army is doing to other civilians. This doesn't wash. This sort of justification is immediately ignored when faced with horrific events that are well documented from the U.S. military. Events like the My Lai Massacre in Vietnam, or some of the documented murders that have occurred during the U.S. occupations of the last two decades in the Middle East. Do these events justify another country dropping atomic bombs on U.S. civilians in U.S. cities? According to this defense, 
it would. The dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, according to this defense, it would. We really need to test these justifications against how we would hold others accountable. In this same vein, there is a good article from Ralph Rako published by the Mises Institute. In it, he quotes Leo Szilard, a world-renowned physicist. If the Germans had dropped the atomic bombs on cities instead of us, we would have defined the droppings of atomic bombs on cities as a war crime, and we would have sentenced the Germans who were guilty of this crime to death at Nuremberg and hanged them. You'll see people use this phrase, sometimes good people must do bad things to stop bad people. This is a false dichotomy. When good people do bad things, they cease to be, quote, good people. At that point, you just have bad people stopping bad people by using the most amount of violence. First record of the Dome of Nagasaki, target for atom bomb number two, is filmed from a super fortress many miles away. Beneath that sinister pall of smoke, the world's most destructive force has been unleashed, with what results we know only too well. One more thing I think Christians really need to consider is an underreported detail about the Nagasaki bombing. Gary G. Coles points out in his article, Christianity and the Nagasaki Bomb, that on August 9, 1945, an all-Christian bomber crew dropped a plutonium bomb on Nagasaki City, Japan, instantly vaporizing, incinerating, irradiating, and otherwise annihilating tens of thousands of innocent civilians, men, women, and children. Very few Japanese soldiers were affected. In a nation whose citizens are historically non-Christian, a disproportionately large number of the Nagasaki victims were Christian. The bomb mortally wounded uncountable thousands of other victims who succumbed to the blast trauma, the heat trauma, and or the radiation trauma. In 1945, the U.S. was regarded as the most Christian nation in the world. The bomber crew, as were the two Christian military chaplains of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki crews, were products of the type of Christianity that failed to teach what Jesus taught concerning violence, and that it was forbidden to his followers. Ironically, prior to the bomb exploding directly over the Yurikami Cathedral, Nagasaki was the most Christian city in Japan, and the massive cathedral had been the largest Christian building in the Orient. A little further down in the article, Coles tells us more about the Nagasaki Christians. From 1600 to 1850, being a Christian in Japan was a capital crime, punishable by death. In the early 1600s, Japanese Christians who refused to recant of their new faith were subjected to unspeakable tortures, including crucifixion. After a well-publicized mass crucifixion was orchestrated, the reign of terror stopped, and it appeared to all observers that Japanese Christianity was extinct. However, 250 years later, after the gunboat diplomacy of U.S. Commodore Matthew Perry forced open an offshore island for American trade purposes, it was discovered that there were thousands of baptized Christians in Nagasaki, living their faith in secret in a catacomb-like existence, completely unknown to the government. With this revelation, the Japanese government started another purge. But because of the international pressure, the persecution stopped and Nagasaki Christianity came up from the underground. By 1917, with no financial help from the government, the revitalized Christian community had built their massive cathedral in the Yurikami River district of Nagasaki. So it was the height of irony that the massive cathedral one of only two Nagasaki landmarks that could be positively identified from 31,000 feet up, became ground zero. In 
The other identifiable aiming point landmark was the Mitsubishi Armaments Factory Complex, which had run out of raw materials because of the successful Allied naval blockade. At 11.02 a.m., during Thursday morning confessions, an unknown number of Nagasaki Christians were boiled, evaporated, carbonized, or otherwise disappeared in a scorching radioactive fireball that exploded 500 meters above the cathedral. A little further down, he writes, Most Nagasaki Christians did not survive the blast. 6,000 of them died instantly, including all who were at confessions that morning. Of 12,000 church members, 8,500 of them eventually died as a result of the bomb. Many of the others were seriously sickened by a highly lethal, entirely new disease, radiation sickness. Located near the cathedral were three orders of nuns and a Christian girls' school. They all disappeared into black smoke and became chunks of charcoal. Tens of thousands of other innocent non-Christian, non-combatants also died instantly. And many more were mortally or incurably wounded. Some of the original victims and their progeny are still suffering from the transgenerational malignancies and immune deficiencies caused by the deadly plutonium and other radioactive isotopes produced by the bomb. And here is one of the most important ironies. What the Japanese imperial government could not do in 250 years of persecution, American Christians did in mere seconds. And to bring you this story, we interrupt our program. An American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima. The White House has just made an important announcement on the war. Buzzing with the news of the atomic bomb. We knew the world would not be the same. We have now added a new and revolutionary increase in destruction. Aren't sure yet what hit the place. The Japanese have seen what our atomic bomb can do. It's almost beyond the comprehension of mere human. I realize the tragic significance of the atomic bomb. And even now, after hearing many times the description of this new weapon, its capabilities continue to tempt human imagination. I want to repeat something I said at the start of all this. The righteousness of all military activity from the U.S. has been so built up within the hearts and minds of the U.S. citizens that it must be defended at all cost. Because if we question the motives of the U.S. wars and conflicts, we risk questioning the legitimacy of the sacrifices from our relatives. I really do sympathize with this. I think it's important to recognize, because in my experience, when we are talking to people that have lost loved ones in war, their immediate defense of all military actions isn't as much because of a highly invested fear of invasion or that they strongly believe in all the rhetoric that we went over today. But it is a highly invested fear that the loss of their parent or child, brother or sister, fear of that loss being for nothing. We can talk quite a bit about philosophy and historical record, but what I think lurks deep down in these defenses for something like intentionally bombing civilians is the need to not have been duped the need for that loss of life or limb to not have been for nothing. So for what it's worth, maybe keep that in the back of your mind when presenting this episode and the info we went over to your friends and family. It's important information. It should stay out there. We should get it out there more. We should have it in the back of our minds for whenever people address the nuclear bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the fire bombings of Tokyo. I hope this was a good dive into the majority of the rhetoric and historical narratives surrounding the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Like I said, it's not exhaustive, but I think I hit on the majority of the points that are brought up in this argument. I'll have links to all the resources and books and quotes that I've mentioned in the show notes. I think I'll close this out with a statement from MacArthur's speech on the battleship Missouri after the Japanese officially signed the surrender. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always.
These proceedings are closed. Don't forget to subscribe to the Anarcho-Christian Podcast on whatever podcatcher you're using. If you're not sure where to find us, visit anarchochristian.com slash subscribe. There you'll find links to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Android, Google Play, Spotify, and YouTube. If you're enjoying the podcast, please consider letting us know by leaving a five-star rating and review on iTunes or wherever you catch the episodes. Also, like and share the episodes on Facebook and the other social media sites. You can support the show with a monthly donation through Patreon or Subscribestar, or a one-time donation through PayPal. You can visit us on those sites, or you can visit the Support the Show tab on anarchochristian.com. That will take you to a page where you'll find links to Patreon, Subscribestar, and PayPal. So I think that's it for today. Grace and peace. No King but Christ. Thank you for listening to the Anarcho-Christian Podcast. Subscribe to our email notifications at anarchochristian.com. Like us on facebook.com backslash anarchochristian. And follow us on Twitter at anarchoxp. Subscribe to our podcast and YouTube to join us next time as we continue to evaluate the relationship between the Christian and the state. No King but Christ. And here is one of the most important ironies. What the Japanese imperial government could not do in 250 years of persecution, American Christians did in mere seconds. And to bring you this story, we interrupt our program. An American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima. The White House has just made an important announcement on the war. Buzzing with the news of the atomic bomb. He knew the world would not be the same. We have now added a new and revolutionary increase in destruction. Aren't sure yet what hit the place. The Japanese have seen what our atomic bomb can do. It's almost beyond the comprehension of mere human. I realize the tragic significance of the atomic bomb. And even now, after hearing many times the description of this new weapon, its capabilities continue to tempt human imagination.